So I was really happy to have the opportunity to show these collage drawings that were going on at the same time. And in my studio, I have a ton of drawings that basically never have been seen or shown. Um, but they show a lot about the process, how I think. And you know, you're talking about connection of different styles, you know, as part of the game. And it's very natural with the collage to do that. But I would say what's driving it is trying to figure out a, um, a collision of elements in the space so that I'm trying to record uh, kind of the um, way I perceive the environment, like simultaneous imagery that connects or bodily moving through the space and seeing things peripherally and in front of me and how, you know, I might be looking at the massive bridge, but I'm really focused on the bird and sort of the poetics of that. It's almost filmic in a sense. It's the psychology of how I'm looking at the space. And the collage can put that together like quicker than the paintings do. And so just to um, follow that, that little thread, do you um, end up looking at the collages as having uh, sort of a more you know, radical disjunction and is there some, if so, is there some kind of pleasure you get from that? Like to move from photographic material yeah, to Yeah, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's sort of like you can do whatever you want with it. You could put a photograph right in, or you can just rip it, or cut it, or shift it. Or, I mean, to me, that is like so much fun. And everybody knows here about, you know, how much I love teaching color theory, where we cut paper and move it all around. And what, that's such a strong, fluid, creative process um, for me. Um, and I wish it was quicker in the paintings, but the paintings are bigger puzzles that take longer to solve, you know. So the paintings are, are evolve through a process. It's a different process. And it's not like I would say that's exactly working for me. I wish the paintings were more like the collage process and faster, but for now this is what, you know, how it ends up. Well, what do you think you would get? Uh, what would you gain? If the process was just like you said, like bigger um, juxtapositions, stronger, more abrupt, shocking kind of collisions of, of visual information, maybe. Yeah. Well, given given that you always have the option and are always passing up the option to literally glue a big photograph onto your painting, right? Like there, there's got to be something at stake about real harmonizing. Well, the painting is a different space. I mean, that's like, at least in my mind, the way I was developed over the years and the way I was trained, I guess you could say formalist, but I see it as like a, a real strong rectangular space that has certain potential. So that's something I'm very, I wouldn't say loyal to, but um, it still remains a mystery to me to how to activate and how to work with that. And so it comes from abstraction to the image. I mean, it really is something that um, I approach it differently. Like you can see the, the drawings, they're not even rectangular. Some of them are off shape and you know, glued in different sizes. And so that's not the same consideration. But that's more about scale and imagery and mark making. And um, the paintings are you know, traditional in the sense of how I'm trying to activate that space with perspective and eye level and atmosphere and how it reacts to the body and symmetry and all these are, are things I'm concerned with. So I want to follow this thread just a, a little bit longer. Um, because there, there is this branch of uh, contemporary painting that's been around for a while that it was originally called uh, bad painting, but it was not a, meant as a pejorative term, uh, it sort of swept up some incredibly good painters into it, like some late Philip Gustin mm -hmm. was called bad painting, but in fact it was, if you were sensitive to painting, you could see a kind of virtuosity in every touch, I think. Yeah. Um, but as uh, artists started to become more de-skilled, and part of it had to do with the way they were being educated or not educated, you know, bad painting became in some ways genuinely bad and the more <laughs> yes. it became a kind of became a kind of attitude that that I think 
So I'm taking this is an artist I actually admire, um, who I think is involved in this, someone like Albert Holden. Mm -hmm. And I think I, you know, I haven't researched him, but I think that the th general thing that's at, at stake there is wanting to stay ahead of the artistic quality. Because once something becomes art by this theory, once it looks like art, then it, it kind of, it, then there's this layer of, you know, aestheticization that gets in between the viewer and the experience. And so if you stay ahead of aestheticization, then somehow it's more direct, like it's more of a gut punch. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it seems like Olin is sometimes in the business of, of really trying to uh, get every last bit of grace out of the painting. And I'm, and I'm wondering about your, because it's, to me, your, their, your aesthetic affinities are very strong. Like they're really pleasurable. Mm -hmm. They're much more on the side of, of visual pleasure to me than they are on the side of like confrontationalness or, re or rebelliousness or anti-aestheticism or de-skilling. That was a very long preamble. <laughs> I'm still there. I'm okay. following you. So, okay. <laughs> so, so how do you navigate this this real um, thematic interest in in disjunction and chaos and opposites clashing with what seems to me to be an aesthetic impulse towards like beautiful harmonizing? You know. Yes, I think. I mean, it comes down to the formal elements in a way, like you know, building it up so there's expectations and then getting it to the place where it's teetering on um, falling apart. So just where it's not quite balanced, you know? So, you know, building up something that, look, if it repeated one more time, it would be too harmonious, it'd be too balanced. And just working with that um, kind of equilibrium, throwing equilibrium off, I think. And then just sort of, getting to the place where, I mean, I know so many tricks I could make a harmonious painting just like, in a, you know, so easily that to surprise myself, to um, rupture it, to keep putting things in that would uh, add surprises is what drives me to keep going. Do you feel like you have a, a complicated or uncomplicated relationship to the idea of beauty and making beautiful things? Yeah, complicated. I would say complicated. Can you expand on that? Well, um, I want there to be a lot of, like, really, you know, a lot of tension between the dualities in the work, between the polarities. And so you see this pull from, a, you know, if you looked at a lot of my work, you would see continual pull from above and below, you know, from inside, outside, from darkness and light. Even though I use color a lot, I feel like um, I'm trying to create these contrasts. So. Like the painting, maybe to the left is could it's not very beautiful, you know. It feels like it's more terrifying, and it's got a lot of black, and it feels a little threatening. Yet the the globe or the sense of the fallen, you know, compromised geodesic dome is trying to hold it into a beautiful state of idealism. So there's that contrast where that's where the content of my work I think comes in where it's um, as much as we try to see things as whole and concrete and we want them to be that way, that we know there's an underlying sense of fracture and disintegration that we're dealing with at the, in this day and age. And especially through the lens of the, app, you know, the environment, which I'm really involved with, um, you know, the state of environmental you know, collapse or climate rupture, or however you want to say it. Um, yeah. So then, is is the idea of making something beautiful? Does it um, evoke too much of something that is, you know, sells a fictitious idea about the state of the world we're in? No, it's it just that beauty is cloying, and beauty is about seduction. I mean, we've had discussions about this, like in previous reading groups and stuff. I mean, beauty is a, a way to seduce the viewer, and color is beautiful. Color is a way to seduce the viewer. 
you know, like you just start to try to understand the relationships of the color and the light and so on. But, you know, once the viewer is in the space, and I really try to use pattern and repetition and color to get the viewer engaged in the space, then the uncomfortable quality, which I feel is more of a reflection of the condition of the world, which is kind of in, unstable, is allowed to come through that beauty. But if it were more consistently all the way across, like, you know, like really seamless, I think it would be, yeah, like a fiction that had no doubt to it, you know. I think that doubt is a big part of my work. You know, like asserting something that is, um, should be like this, we kind of think it's like this, but actually, no, it's more like this. You know, it's more like there's only one wing on the bird, and this is undermined, and this is flowing over, and so that you're starting to understand that those, uh, the content is coming through the form of the painting that way. I, I think that we, we share some of this interpretation of this idea of the beautiful, and, and, and at some point we depart, though I'm not exactly sure where. We haven't had this conversation. Mm -hmm. Specifically, um, but I do. I, the, the overlap comes in the idea of the, the beautiful being seductive, mm -hmm. and I, I think of a work of art it being seductive as is not producing any particular set of forms or even visual principles, but rather an attitude toward or an attitude that a work of art has or an artist has towards the viewer, which is that. I am going to, whatever it is I am t telling you or showing you, I am going to lure you in through pleasure. Mm -hmm. As opposed to say, I'm going to make it your moral responsibility to understand this because this work of art will improve you. Yeah, that's more like the didactic so yeah, side of it. Yeah, right. And so I, I, I then think of seduction as being like a way that you can use pleasure to essentially get anything else you want mm -hmm. into the mix. And it, which doesn't mean that every subject is deserving of beauty um, in its treatment. I mean, I think that, you know, it's part of, color is part of what was so central to the Dana Schutz controversy and still painting, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, that the color was so joyful in a way. Um, but taking a painting like the one you pointed out, um, now, there are just so many contemporary painters who, if I were to look at their painting next to that, I would feel like they'd taken, they'd taken a hammer and smashed their painting hand before they started painting that day. <laughs> and I can name names if you want, but I was just okay. talking okay. to somebody about how weird it is to smash other artists. And, <laughs> um, and, so, and so in that sense, it's like, it, it, you know, for me, the seduction means like I'm all in, like I'm, I'm there and I'm, I'm just going to look at every part of it and I'm going to think about every, mm -hmm. everything that maybe you would want me to think about. Um, and so I guess that, that to me seems like a, a difference in the way we see your work, you know, that you, you see more moves that, that hold that at bay and I just feel seduced, but in a positive way, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, what seduces you into the work? It may not just be the color. It, yeah, it's definitely not just the color. I mean, I you think... can have, there's some seats up here, you guys, up in there, too. I mean, part of it is rhythm, right? Rhythm, pattern. What? Well, what? Some time ago, you, you made a comment that it's almost like you and I are interested in exactly the same places in the world, but, but we, I, I approach them from the, the realist position and you right. approach them from the abstract position. We both have kind of like a apocalyptic narrative landscape. You know, you've seen the, um, Daniel's work, right? But his is like, it is sort of like a magical place. You know, mine is a place that is like clattering and moving and coming apart. You know, it's more of a, it's probably more like like motion and music and things that are in, like, someone wrote about my work, it was um, Leah Ullman, and she wrote that it's a machine. I was painting machines, but that the painting itself was a machine. 
that there's a mechanism that goes on. And each painting kind of finds its own little wheel of moving around and how that works. And so I, I think about it as a mechanical kind of world that keeps moving and shifting. And so you finally get into a rhythm of something, but then you get caught by another peripheral thing. And I mean, part of what I'm interested in is in the incongruity of the birds with the machinery and lines of communication. That's why the show's called Conveyance, because the ships are conveying, you know, that's, they're bringing things in and out, and then the birds are conveying. And there's all these lines of communication that we barely have any sense about. But in my psyche, there's all the stuff that's communicating, that's miscommunicating, that we can barely perceive. And, you know, it's an animated world. That this idea that the painting is a machine is, is, I think, one of the things that suggests is that the process is highly reactive. Yeah, highly reactive. Okay, so you see, do something, you see it, and it's almost like the painting asks for the next move. Oh yeah, and it's I I paint on about ten paintings at once. I mean, look at the birds out there; right now. they're all over it. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, thank goodness there's no rainbow out there. Right? <laughs> You'd have to go paint. Uh, I know, but um, <laughs> they really aren't crazy. But uh, yeah, it is really reactive, um, and I work on several paintings at once. So. Um, some of them are problems that are difficult to solve, and some just keep generating uh, solutions when you look at them. React, they're very, it's very reactive. And, and that's something that I've, I've never been able to do, which is to have, it's almost like it's an anxiety or security thing, where I sort of need to know the destination to a much higher degree of certainty than I think you do. Um, and it's, that's embedded in the look of your work, that mm -hmm. it seems like any given painting uh, could have gone completely sideways and ended up in a garbage heap, or it, it could have, you know, followed the path that it did and ended up on a public. Who was wall. asking me today how many paintings I destroyed? Was it you, Chris? Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, hundreds, right? Mm -hmm. Hundreds. And I think the way I've gotten around destroying them, I mean, just radical process is how I find things interesting. Otherwise, I'm bored. So you know, pouring. Now I'm printing. I used to paint in the dark. You know, I'm constantly turning them upside down, looking at them in different ways, so that I don't see the familiar. So it's interesting for me. It's not boring. And, and then there are these like uncanny little moments of overlap in the sense of like we both love scaffolding. Yeah, you know, who doesn't love scaffolding? Okay, maybe maybe we love scaffolding. Um, but you know, cranes, scaffolding. Yeah. I mean, are, those, are those like like light fixtures or are those? Those are cell towers. Okay. Yeah, those are, um, actually it's a, it, that image is repeated three times, like you see the bottom small one, it's a, a cell tower, and then it, it inverts and it inverts again, so it's three different times, three different times. So the cell tower, you know, came from like this, you know, also the microwave, I mean the, the satellite dishes, and you know, just trying to think about how information, how we're trying to gather information to try to control or to like, monitor the world, but and at the same time we're completely blind to it, you know, so it's that they're like blind, like machines. So like um, a couple of microwave towers are uh, in the middle, like those circles are like sensory, looking out but not seeing, you know, and like the sense of this atmosphere is coming through it. So that's where that image comes from, and it's, see it's up in the air, oh, a couple on that one. Yeah. When, when I was scanning around, you gave me some links. I also sort of scanned around myself. And what what's interesting about I think it's your at least your recent work um, is that so much of the conversation about it starts with um, ways of conceptualizing this place. You know, mm -hmm. San Pedro, Long Beach, the port, mm -hmm. um, and. And then that becomes an, an entry point into certain artistic ideas about like sublime landscapes, and then how you know maybe that tradition is gendered in a certain way, and how you know reorienting it and regendering it differently. And well, what's interesting to me about it is that so much of what sort of sets up the conversation 
all if you if somebody had never seen your work, they could imagine really explicitly depicted paintings. Yeah, yeah. Right, and so it's sort of like uh, I guess my, my my the first question I kind of wrote down was like, what what is it about um, your what is it about your relationship to abstraction? Or what is it about the use of abstraction? Well, I mean, my work was depicted. I mean, it's like if you were to look through my archives, which I don't even have organized, but I mean, it used to be figurative. I told my students that. Um, and they were these big rhapsodic, you know, things about chemical spills and figures, and it was really dramatic. And then I did birds, bird imagery and like bird sanctuary imagery. For like years and years, the bird is a recurring uh, theme, and then I was mostly known for the Katrina series, which were very depictive. Those were really, really illusionistic. Lots of perspective rendering, lots of light, even though there was multiple spaces. And then that became like um, restrictive and very, um, you know, it was just too pictorial. It's you know, I don't feel. I don't feel comfortable in the realm of painting illustrating anything, you know. So I want the painting to be its own um, generative structure, its own completely open form. So then I have a quandary because I want to talk about political, environmental issues, but I want to paint abstractly. So you know, how do you do that? You know, how do you make a painting stand on its own, on its own, and still reflect something that you have a deep connection to in the world? And that's, it's very difficult. And that's why I go back to like, if the form can show the content in some way that the viewer can feel it in their body or sense it in their psyche, then it's starting to work on them. And part of that is hooking the viewer in for a long period of time. So it's like a puzzle. So if you're looking at that puzzle and you just, then at least I have that chance where it might slip in. So that's why I'm concerned with time and time is created by, you know, all the things like rhythm and repetition and space and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's how I've sort of reconciled it, you know. So, starting with abstraction, working really into pictorial rendering, really clearly images, and then back out again towards abstraction. Okay, so oh, I'm going to pick up on that idea of like, <clears throat> like when you feel like you're illustrating something and how that like just goes dead in your hands and, and and it seems like that is connected in the way you put it to there being a way that the painting can stand sort of as its own construct that, yeah. that it doesn't need its relationship to some exterior thing that it's depicting to give it its work yes exactly um, and and so it, it makes me wonder about your relationship to the, I mean, I, I once saw somewhere or heard somewhere, maybe it was even from you, this, that, the, the, that there was a, an assertion of your paintings being abstract expressions, which I thought was this one. It sounded bizarre to me. Um, even though it's obvious that there is some um, residue from that tradition there. but. Um, Given this longing for like an autonomous picture that doesn't rely on external reference, even though it hasn't, um, what is your relationship to the modernist project of, of being highly reductive in abstraction to get the painting to be purely autonomous painting, free of external reference, such that it could only be painted and never, and the furthest away from illustration, it's essentially right. a monogram or something. I mean, it's funny because it's like, a it's like a wish list, you know, and I have all these paintings like around the studio that are just blank color fields. They're <laughs> just sitting there, I'm like, those are the best paintings in the studio. <laughs> you know, and I look at them, they're just under paintings, and I just don't ever paint on them. And I think, it could just be that simple, you know, it could just be that simple. <laughs> but then when I start painting, you know, I want to throw my experience of the world. And I think that what motivates me is a sense of, the ecstatic, like being ecstatic in the world. I think it's like a, it's like a panic. It's like a sense of, you know, you know, look at the fullness in the world. I don't want it to be, you know, and you know that artist I showed you in the hall today? I was showing some of you, Sarah Sutton. Um, I discovered it, I felt excited, but um, 
you know, there's so many repetition, there's so much information that it's about excess. It's about building an excess. And we're in the world of excess. And I'm like, well, this could just be better if it was more of it. If it was big and you had a lot of it, and I'm going, no, that wouldn't be better. And this is a dialogue I'm having. Like, is reductive better? Is more complex better? You know, like, um, where can I get that balance of having enough elements so that it's mechanically active and um, visually, you know, sustained, but not at the same time just yardage of all of this stuff either. You know what I'm saying? So like I've moved away. I've, I've done paintings that were really large that had a million things in them. And it talks about a certain thing in the environment, like how complex information systems are and cities are and so on. But um, that's not really what I'm after right now. I'm after more of a um, correlation between the sky and the land, between animals and us, between air and toxicity and, you know, this kind of um, multiple pairing and collision of all these forces, that I want them to come together in some type of resolution, rather than depicting it like linearly over a long period of time. Did I get off the track with that? No, I mean, I'm not I way off. I don't know what the question was. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think that there's, there's something in there about, like, it is more and more, it is yeah. less more. Um, yeah, you said reductive. That's what that um, yeah. <laughs> an, an autonomous painting mm -hmm. that, and I and I think of contradictions. I mean, if, if I'm bringing things up or framing them as contradictions, that doesn't in, in art that that is actually possibly some of the most productive things about a work of art. It's you know it's not like a logical argument where contradiction is a big flaw. It's mm -hmm. like you know it, paradox, because, contradiction. Right. I mean, yeah. as, or it's what it's what. Uh, Gerhard Richter calls just the usual mess. Yeah. And of course, there would be all these yes. contradictions in this work because what do you what would you expect from life, which never resolves itself into yeah. a coherent narrative. Yeah. Um, but th there's this kind of contradiction about, to me, productive contradiction about wanting to make a painting that is autonomous and stands on its own terms, and a painting that is simultaneously totally referential and even in some ways reverent or ecstatic about. A particular place that's yeah. really tuned to the particularities right. of the place. Yeah, I can't say that my work is meant to do that at all. I mean, to be tuned to the particularities of a place. So, what you paint and what is written about it are two different things. I mean, clearly, you know. I mean, this is. I've always painted about the environment that I lived in. Sometimes I paint when I'm about events that happen in another place in the world because it will trigger my imagination more. But there's no way you could say A is A and B is B. It's just, this is a product of someone who lives here, period. I mean, that's about it, you know? And then other forms that come into it are, you know, they're deeper. They go back through time, even they go into painting history, they go into collected imagery, you know? So it's pretty eclectic. It, this is um, a little more general than your work, but since you brought up this idea of like, you know, when, when you feel like you're falling into the illustration, then, you, then you're then you motivated to push against that, and that seems to correlate to pushing against depiction, explicit depiction. Not that it ever totally goes away, but that it, it gets less explicit. Um, is, is there a way of talking about the illustrative function of a work of art that isn't a, also describing a loss of quality? in it because you know i'm sure that there are, we could name 30 paintings that we both love that are that so beautifully illustrate a thing right 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 you know i mean yeah there's beautiful there's many paintings like that but i think it's it's the belief system of the artist that does that it's the it's the sustain the psychology of the artist that could sustain that throughout and it becomes a believable world you know, those are like, I mean, the, the artist just has to have that integrity. And you can see it, no matter what the stylistic tendency of the work is, in how that, to me, how that um, holds true. Okay, so so then illustration just sort of is in the center of the bullseye for you as an artist. You yeah. Know, you, don't, you don't end up believe, believing, you don't feel like you have the same level of integrity when your main objective is to get to something that's depictive of public. 
so they right. external to the paint. Right. I mean, I'm not depicting surfaces. I mean, your work is depicting like facades or surfaces, the way light is hitting something. I'm depicting like the movement of something behind that, the machinations. You know, it's more like the Brock, you know, studio pictures where the mobiles moving around and things are fracturing, and you know, it's more like Cezanne with the um, articulating of space at different places in the picture plane. So it's not about an image that's rendered. Do you think that, that writers sometimes move towards that because it lends itself to writing? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That, that that's one of the hardest of... things about making abstract art is because people can't articulate it with words. It moves further further away from language. You know. And then unless you've had like a you know formalist training, which I've had and I try to teach, you know, and you don't know <laughs> you know, you don't know how to talk about it, right? Yeah, I mean really. So it's I mean, but like who was I talking about? Maybe it was you, Chris, I don't know, today. But you know, there are painters, certainly painters that I know and hang out with, and my friends in New York, I mean, it's like pure damn abstract painting, and they know what they're doing, and it's really awesome. And when you see it, it's like phenomenal experience, you know. Not that mine is pure abstraction, I don't even go near that, but um, you know, it's mild hybridity, I guess you could call it. Mild, mild hybridity. <laughs> Mild mannered hybridity. <laughs> uh, yeah, mild seems like mild. Yeah. <laughs> um, could you talk about this idea of the feminine sublime? 